one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CCAG's public broadcast. My name is Mitzi Jonel Tan, and I'm a full-time climate justice activist from the Philippines, and I am delighted to be your host today. Um, in the next, in the few weeks since our last broadcast, which looked at the critical developing situation in Antarctica, extreme weather events have exploded across North America, Asia, and Europe in the form of heat waves, violent storms, flooding, and wildfires. I'm speaking to you today from the Philippines, where we are actually in the middle of a storm, and a, a storm just left us um, a few days ago uh, as well. And we're really seeing how the Philippines and across the world, we're experiencing more and more extreme weather events that are getting more and more intense, um, and not just storms and typhoons for the Philippines, but also heat waves. And we're also seeing how that is affecting a lot of the health of our young people and elderly, especially because we're not able to adapt to the heat that's happening. And that's already coming from a place like the Philippines, which is used to the heat, um, which brings us really nicely to today's topic where this extreme weather event forms the worrying backdrop of today's meeting, the health impacts of the climate crisis. So today we'll be looking at how climate breakdown is fueling a global health crisis and the mitigation strategies we need to put in place to build resilience for the future. I'm very excited to welcome CCAG's newest member, Professor Salim Hook, who is one of the world's preeminent experts in adaptation to climate change in developing countries. Mark, Salim, our esteemed CCAG members, welcome. I'm also excited to welcome CCAG's panel of world leading climate experts, in particular, Professor Mark Maslin, who will open our discussion. Um, and finally, we are also lucky enough to be joined by today, our guests, UCL's Dr. Marina Romaneo, Executive Director of the Lancet Countdown, and Sanjay M. Sisodia, Professor of Neurology at the UCL Institute of Neurology. And we have also been sent a question by climate activist, Iris Zan. Thank you all for participating, taking in, Thank you all for taking part in our discussion today. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Professor Mark Maslin, who has prepared some slides today on today's topic. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Mitzi. And I am going to share the screen. And what I'm hoping to do in the next 10 minutes is just to give you an insight to how climate change is going to affect global health. And many of us will argue it is already affecting it. And we need to actually be able to deal with it and actually put it into our health plans. So the first thing is, let's step back. Humans have a comfort zone. We all know that. It's between about 20% and 70% relative humidity. And temperatures are between about 22 to about 26 or 27 degrees and therefore, what we do is we live all over the world. But what we do is we use our technology to make sure we keep within that comfort zone. And so to do that, we have shelter, because in many places, it's too cold most of the year. We have heating to make sure we counter that. But also there are areas where it's too hot. So we have cooling, but we also then have to rehydrate because, of course, of our natural body sweats. And so the interesting thing is in the globe, there is a very small zone that we actually inhabit. So what I'm trying to do is hopefully we can look at how climate change is affecting that comfort zone and the societal links around it. So. I was very lucky. I was the climatologist on the original 2009 paper, Managing the Health Effects of Climate Change. And the Lancet then got excited that this had created a huge interest in climate change and global health. And we called it the biggest global threat to health in the 21st century. And this then led to the Lancet Countdown, uh, which Marina is the uh, chief executive of, and we started to publish papers every single year, which showed a number of indicators which linked climate change and health. It was a sort of like a countdown to the SDGs of 2030. They're all incredibly useful documents with lots of information. And they are really quite worrying because what we see is firstly, the temperatures have been rising. So if we look at the global surface temperatures, it's been rising. 2020 was the warmest year on record. 
But interestingly enough, 2022, last year, 28 countries around the world recorded their highest temperatures ever. And I like the warming stripes by Ed Hawkins that give you a different way of actually presenting this. So that temperature has a marked effect because what we're doing is we're putting more moisture into the atmosphere. So it's becoming wetter, but we are also heating up. So if we look at climate change, what we're doing is we're moving our comfort zone to the top right. We're moving it much more towards the hot, wet conditions all around the world. And this actually drives a lot of the health concerns. So what are the main effects of climate change? Well, we're seeing, like the Philippines, more extreme storms, floods, droughts, heat waves, and wildfires. Sea level rise is also causing increased coastal and riverine flooding. And we're seeing this lead to food and water insecurity. And the big question is, could this lead to migration and possible conflict in the future? But if we have a look at this year, it's already been mentioned, we have three extreme heat domes, one over North America, one over Southern Europe, and one over China and Southeast Asia. We have temperatures last week, Rome 44, Sicily 48, Death Valley 51.7 and China 52.3. Extreme weather because the jet stream has been pushed so far north due to climate change. It's been caught and stagnated by Greenland. And therefore, you have these heat domes just literally heating up the area more and more. And they still haven't dispersed. And heat waves are the silent killer. Um, in London last year, we had a 40 degree heat wave, which uh, I love this uh, comparison. We were making theoretical predictions that we will get 40 degrees in 2050, not 2022. 3000 excess deaths occurred during those two days because of that heat. To put it in context, a 40 degree heat wave in London was 16 degrees warmer than the peak temperature for July, which is 24 degrees, for the last decade. And we also know that the number of vulnerable people that are actually being exposed to heat waves has increased massively over the last 30 to 40 years. People now experience 3.7 billion more person days of heat waves than they did back in the 1990s. We also worry because there is that physiological limit when it is too hot and too humid. And this is why many climatologists use the wet bulb temperature, because that actually tells us when it is literally impossible to be outside and to work. We know that we've lost 470 billion potential labor hours in 2021 costing the economy something like $700 billion. And the biggest countries, as you can see, are in, of course, the tropics. And most of the loss is in the agricultural sector, particularly affecting food production and food supplies from small farms. Droughts, we've seen 30% more of the globe affected by extreme droughts in the last decade than we did in the 1950s to 60s. And as you can see, huge increase. That increases food insecurity, water insecurity, and has a huge damaging effect on sanitation, which is critical for human health. We also have seen wildfires. We just literally had to look at Canada. We look at sort of Greece. We can see those happening. But they're also happening in places like the UK. And remember the darkness of Australia when we had those huge wildfires. 60% of the countries have had an increase in the number of days when people are exposed to incredibly high or extremely high fire danger. And the interesting thing is it has a huge health effect, not just because of the direct threat to life, but because the amount of soot and dust 
in the actual atmosphere causes major problems with breathing. Just think of the dark skies that were seen over New York in the last couple of months. And we also have to remember that we have all these impacts, but we also have to think about our own mental health because many people understand the actual problem with climate change. They understand how vulnerable we are. They understand how much we are being exposed to these issues, but they feel powerless to do anything about it because as many of us feel, governments aren't listening. Governments aren't operating quick enough. We have lots of climate change deniers saying, oh, no, it's not real. Don't worry. Um, everything's fine when we can see the planet is burning. And that creates a lot of personal mental illness. It causes a lot of stress. And we've seen a huge expansion in climate anxiety, particularly in young people. So when we're looking at human health, we have to look at the physical impacts, the long term physical impacts of smoke and lack of nutrition and food insecurity. But we also have to think about people's well being and think about how to counter climate anxiety by supporting people in local initiatives, but also making governments actually take this seriously. So to end, I would say that really, if you think about it, our health is really all that matters. Somebody pointed out to me, we only get 4,000 weeks on this planet each on average. And so therefore we need to make it actually matter. So we need win-win solutions that are centered on human health. So if we're thinking about reforestation, think about human health. If we're thinking about how we generate energy, think about human health. If we think about diet, definitely think about human health. So for me, we should think about climate change from the point of human health. How do we improve people's human health? How do we improve their safety? And how do we actually get the medics all around the world who are a trusted voice of sanity? How do we make sure that they're fully involved and on our side and help us with this messaging? Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Mark, for all of that. It was really insightful and it really it was just like a yet another wake up call that all of this is happening right now. And as a young person who does have um, struggles with climate anxiety, I re definitely resonated in what you said about finding that support system, but also finding a way to make sure that governments understand that the, the source of this climate anxiety is the betrayal of governments for not doing anything. And it's understanding that with the comfort zones and people use having shelter, heating, cooling, hydration, there are also large parts of humanity who don't have access to these. And they are the ones who are most vulnerable, both to the physical health impacts and the impacts of the climate crisis and the mental health impacts. And they're usually the ones who are least supported. And these are our small farmers, our small fisher folk, the urban poor, the indigenous peoples, who are also, again, advertently affected by the food insecurity that's happening. Um, so it just really reminds you that there's still a lot for us to do. And um, I guess if I had one question straight away, it would be just how big is the challenge facing health services in the coming years and decades? Um, we saw the COVID-19 pandemic and how it really devastated our health system. So how do you think it would compare with the strain on even the best healthcare systems during the COVID-19? So for me, I think that um, we will look back at COVID and see this as a minor crisis compared with the health crisis of climate change. The reason being is there are other factors that are compounding the issue. Firstly, of course, in many countries, we have a uh, population that is aging rapidly. And that means that we have a lot more people that are moving into that vulnerable population, which is much more sensitized to the issues of sort of like heat waves, uh, droughts and problems like that. So that's the first part. The second part is we also have a real issue with extreme poverty around the world. We still do not have, there's 1 billion people that still do not have access to safe 
clean drinking water. And of course, these issues are going to be exacerbated by climate change. So it's that balancing act that we're actually having a lot of vulnerable people in the world, billions of people that are going to be affected by climate change. And this is going to create a major health issue. And the problem is what uh, I think the Lancet original paper in 2009 was saying was, wow, we're trying to do all these great things. The medics around the world are trying to do all these great things to make people healthier, live longer, etc. And they're doing great stuff. But it's all going to be wiped out by the impacts of climate change if we, A, don't actually mitigate and reduce our um, emissions as quick as possible, but also if we don't put it into our healthcare system, if we don't mitigate and actually understand what's actually going on and actually build it into our health programs. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm going to hand it over now for to our first guest, Professor Sanjay M. Sisadia. Thanks so much for joining us today, Sanjay. Could you give us your own insight on this topic before sharing your question? Thank you very much, Mitzi. Um, I have to say I agree uh, with everything Mark has said. I think this is a, a real crisis for healthcare, uh, and we've seen how healthcare systems can be brought to their knees by events like the pandemic. And I think Mark is exactly right that that's going to be multiplied manifold by the multiple effects of climate change on healthcare systems, on people providing the healthcare, uh, on supplies to hospitals, on supply chains, almost every aspect that you can think of, I think, uh, you know, you can see how climate change will affect it. But I'm not a, a healthcare planner, I'm a, a, a neurologist, um, and uh, I see particularly people with um, difficult to treat epilepsy. And across neurology, I think we're, um, you know, beginning to see uh, signals of the impact of climate change. And I think this is really important to think about. There's lots of work done about vulnerable populations generally. Um, amongst those vulnerable populations will be people with neurological diseases. The brain is critical, obviously, for, for our survival. Uh, we're all here because of our brains. We're all talking and, and, and thinking about this because of our brains. And if the brain is diseased, then you can imagine how the ability to cope with the challenges of climate change will be impacted. You know, there may be biological reasons why we don't um, adapt to the heat uh, as well as we might otherwise do. We may not be able to move. Uh, we may not be able to think about and plan for the problems that climate change is, is, is bringing if the brain is not working properly. So I think there is a need also to think about um, the impacts of climate change for people with neurological diseases as, if you like, a precursor to what may happen to the population more broadly, um, because I think these these uh, people with people with, uh, with neurological diseases are going to be, if you like, in the vanguard of, of vulnerability. And this is happening already. Um, so I see a lot of people with difficult to treat epilepsy. Um, and actually, once you get to discussing this with people with epilepsy and their families, you hear about the problems they're already having with heat waves. We don't do this much. We spend our time mainly talking about, you know, how many seizures have you had? What drugs should we increase the dose of? What should we do to try and keep your head safe from, from falls, from seizures? So we don't have time. But if you actually ask about this, then you hear that people are already struggling. People are putting fans in every room. They're trying to get air conditioning if they can afford it. Um, and they're really worried about heat waves in particular and wondering what they can do. And, and I, I think the last thing I'd say is I, I also completely agree with Mark that, um, that healthcare professionals still retain a trusted um, position in society. And I think that's really important. There is, there is part, I think, of our duty of care is it's, it's multi-directional. We obviously owe that duty of care to the people we see with healthcare problems. But I think we also have to advocate um, for people, uh, especially people with vulnerabilities, and ensure that these problems are understood and heard um, by people to whom medics may have access. So I think I'll probably stop there. There's lots of different areas I think that you know that climate change will impact, uh, and lots of things I think that that medics um, could do uh, to try and help. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, and just sharing, uh, adding to that question uh, and the insights that you shared. So healthcare professionals have experienced through the pandemic 
the need to be able to advise patients on best practice in the face of new challenges with many unknowns. Um, so how best does the panel think healthcare professionals can inform themselves about the challenge of climate change and predictions for its local consequences in order to best advise their patients? Um, Mark, if you want to start. Um, so I think with the incredible medics that we have around the world, and I have to say, uh, I have a huge respect uh, for Sanjay and how they're working with people that are struggling with such debilitating diseases. And then we're seeing things like heat waves making uh, their lives even worse. Um, and for me, I think it's going back to basics. It's that holistic approach, which is when you have a patient, it's then thinking, well, hang on, what are the actual things that are going to impact them? Sort of, uh, again, do they have decent housing? Do they have shelter? Are they able to heat themselves? Because we still have a huge issue with energy, so sort of poverty, and therefore people aren't able to heat their homes properly in winter. We then also then have to think about, are they able to cool themselves in the summer? Are they in a small flat with like six other people and therefore they're going to be very vulnerable? And I'll give you one example of when health professionals suddenly woke up and realized there was an issue. 2003 was probably the worst heat wave we've had in Europe. We'll wait and see what happens this year. And we had something like 70,000 excess deaths because of that heat wave in Northern Europe. And a lot of those were in France and particularly Paris. And the French uh, authorities were absolutely shocked by this because what they hadn't realized is in August, of course, everybody goes on holiday, except, of course, the elderly, the vulnerable population stay in Paris and they were deeply affected by the heat wave. And many of them, unfortunately, passed away because of other complications, which the heat wave then exacerbated. And it's the nighttime temperatures, which is the killer for older, vulnerable people. And what they did was they suddenly realized that they did not know where their vulnerable populations were. They did not have a way of contacting them. They did not have a way of actually saying, right, we can move you to cooling centers. We can actually help you. And they changed that. And they changed that within a year. So when there was another heat wave that wasn't quite as severe in 2007, the medical data is they lost a quarter of the people they would have done if they'd actually not adapted. So when healthcare professionals get it and they suddenly realize that they're looking after vulnerable populations that are going to be hit by these major climate events, then they can do some incredible stuff. So that's really, it's about communicating just the basics, warming, cooling, hydration, food, and security. That's it. Thank you, Mark. And picking up from our question earlier about the COVID-19 pandemic and just seeing how different um, countries responded to that, I wonder, um, Dave, if you have any thoughts about international knowledge share in respects to healthcare um, and how we could collaborate internationally as a global healthcare community. I apologize. Uh, th that is a, a very, very big and important question you're asking me. If, uh, if we look at the international scene, there is not nearly enough transfer of best knowledge, best actions from one country to another. This is an area that needs an enormous amount of work in order to achieve what could be done uh, in a, a relatively simple way. Um, we, we all know that different countries experience very different challenges from climate change. And at the moment, the stress is on the extreme heat in China, in India, and so on. The Philippines, where you are, you're much more used to hot weather than we are in the United Kingdom. And you could say the same about India. India, many people say, my goodness, you, you've experienced 40 degrees, but we experience 40 degrees almost on a regular basis across even northern India. So there are communities that have learned how to live with these uh, very extreme conditions, and we can all learn from them. I don't think there's a, a simple answer to this, but perhaps 
I could just interpose here. What uh, we've been talking about is three R's. Uh, reduction of emissions deeply and rapidly in order to try and achieve a better world. Removal of excess greenhouse gases. We're talking about a, a cataclysmic situation today, even with the amount of greenhouse gas we've already put there. We have to learn how to remove carbon dioxide deeply and rapidly going forward in time so that we can reduce the amount in the atmosphere. We've always argued for repair, research into safe, manageable ways to repair damaged climate systems. But now we're adding a fourth R. And now I'm going to say our strategy is the four R planet strategy. You get what I'm saying. The four R planet strategy, the fourth R is resilience. We are really talking now about improving resilience. When Mark says the 2003 heat wave, 70,000 people died, probably at least half of those could have been avoided with better knowledge of what to do. So the fourth R, resilience, involves comprehensive action to strengthen the capacity of each one of us in different parts of the world to deal with climate impact and threats. And in strengthening that, we have to take on the same knowledge transfer that occurs for the other three R's. We're not all in this in a different situation in the world. We all need to pull together in this the, the biggest challenge that our civilization has ever had to face up to. Thank you, Dave. I completely agree. When activists like me call for climate reparations, for example, it's not just financing, it's also knowledge transfer and technology transfer. But it's also realizing that people in the global north do have something to learn from the people in the global south who are already experiencing this and that it really is a global effort and we need to stop seeing the global south um, who are already impacted as just victims, but also people who have such rich knowledge of how to adapt already. Um, moving on to Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh, one of the specific challenges that Mark touched on earlier was the impact of the climate crisis on people's mental health. And I'd like to just follow on from Sanjay's um, insights earlier with one for Professor Whitmarsh. Could you speak about how climate solutions can improve people's mental health and well and well-being? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks uh, a lot, Mitzi. Um, so yeah, as Mark has mentioned, we know that climate change negatively impacts on people's mental health as well as their physical health. So extreme weather events, for example, and their associated physical, economic and cultural impacts can lead to trauma, PTSD, anxiety, stress. But also you don't have to be directly affected by climate impacts. Just knowing about climate risks can lead to climate anxiety. Um, and we know that these impacts are likely to uh, increase with fur fur further global, global warming and impact on children, young people, elderly, those with underlying health conditions more. Um, so any effective adaptation and mitigation uh, measures that we can take to tackle climate change will help to reduce those mental health impacts. Um, and, and we've talked a bit about some of those, those specific healthcare things that can be done. Um, but on the flip side as well, we also know that taking climate action can bring various health and well-being benefits. So um, IPCC analysis um, in the last year or two showed that most of the demand side climate mitigation options, so measures to reduce emissions, have co-benefits, so wider benefits. Um, and the best evidence ones are for health and well-being. So by just reducing emissions, there are lots of ways in which we can improve people's health and well-being. To give you one example, in a cross-national study that we published a couple of years ago, we found strong evidence that people that have uh, greener lifestyles, so low carbon lifestyles, tend to have higher well-being. So they tend to be happier and, um, and more fulfilled in their lives. And this contradicts, I think, some of the assumptions that to tackle climate change, we need to sacrifice things that, that people will need to give up the sorts of things that, that they are used to and, and that they enjoy in their lives. Actually, the contrary seems to be the case that less consuming less, having lower carbon lifestyles actually seems to be associated with higher well-being. And we know that people who have climate anxiety 
uh, if they take action to tackle climate change, that can help manage their climate anxiety. It can sort of channel that anxiety into something constructive. So actually being part of the solution can improve well-being in various ways as well. So, yeah, I think that it's looking for those that win-wins is, is a key part of this. Thank you, Lorraine. And Mark, would you want to add something? Um so as always, I completely agree with everything that Lorraine said. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, because you were picking up on the comparison of COVID with future climate change, I think one of the most interesting things about COVID is we discovered that stuff doesn't make us happy. During COVID, what, what do we miss? We miss seeing our families. We miss being able to hug. We miss being able to be social. We miss going out to a restaurant with our friends. You know, because we are humans, we are ultra social creatures. And that's what makes us happy, that intera interaction with our friends and family. So it's not stuff. And so I think that's really important. But we should also step that up, which is if, and I say this to everybody, if you feel anxious about climate change or environmental issues around the world, Talk about it. Actually, engage with your best friend, engage with your family, etc., and with your people that you work with. And the strange thing is they'll go, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. No, no, no. Oh, I thought it was just me. And I've seen this time and time again. I work with many companies and one, a billion dollar company that I'm not going to mention. And a couple of people were getting around the coffee table and going, oh, I'm really stressed. And they suddenly shared their stories. And suddenly they went, oh, we, we can do something in the company. Within three to four years, this company was now winning alpha prizes with the Calm Disclosure Project and was going carbon neutral by 2028. OK, boom, you know, just because we talk to each other. And remember, we're humans just talk about our anxiety. It doesn't always help, but at least it will release some of that. And together, we can actually do amazing things. Thank you, Mark. Something that me and my friends always say when we're talking about our climate anxiety is that it is a valid response to the crisis that's happening. It's not an irrational fear over something, um, but really it's something that's a valid thing because of what's happening around us. Um, and now I would like to turn to Dr. Marina Romaneo. Thank you so much for coming today. I understand that you have worked with Mark on research into today's topic. Could you give us some more insight into this and your work with the Lancet Countdown before putting a question to our members? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. And thank you, Mark, for presenting so well the, the findings of the Lancet Countdown. I'm going to get you to do every presentation from now on. Um, Look, one thing that um, to add on to what Mark has already presented that to me is quite important to, to be aware of is that when we talk about the health impacts of climate change, we're not only talking about these impacts in isolation. We generally present them as self-standing points of data or self-standing piece of evidence. But it's important to remember that this is happening all at once and that climate change is affecting our health both directly as well as indirectly by undermining the systems that our good health depends on. Our food systems, the water, the air that we breathe, and things like the transportation system, our buildings, the infrastructure. So when we think about climate change and the solutions, they need, by definition, to be multi-sectorial. We need cooperation of the different actors of society, health professionals working with urban planners, working with those in charge of our um, agricultural systems, with those in charge of how we operate and run our cities to build these solutions together. And there is where the topic of the win-win uh, comes to the fore, because that is the key to how we're gonna succeed in tackling climate change. As we heard from Lorraine already uh, very well articulated, it's important to stop thinking about climate action as something that will cost us and that will represent a loss, but actually about the opportunities of climate action. And Lorraine already talked a bit about um, the, the, the potential improvements on our mental health. We have so many health co-benefits through climate action. And those entail things like, for example, reduced air pollution in our urban centers that reduces the impact of diseases like uh, asthma in children, like heart disease, even neurological diseases associated with the high levels of air pollution that come by and large from the burning of fossil fuels in our urban centers. We can adopt renewable energy technologies. And in that, we would be tackling one of the biggest challenges faced by low-income countries still, that is lack of access to electricity, lack of access 
to energy grids. And as we've seen last year with the energy crisis, the very rapidly increasing um, prices of oil and gas meant that millions around the world were all of a sudden facing energy poverty. And it doesn't have to be that way. Access to energy is also access to development, access to education, access to health. We know that healthier diets, low carbon diets, could save over 10 million lives a year through improved uh, nutrition. So we have all of these opportunities to tackle climate change in a way that will benefit our health and will deliver these enormous co-benefits. But in order to make that happen, we need um, cross-disciplinary work and we need better integration between those working in the energy system, those working in our cultural systems, and those working in the health sector. And as we say from kind of the health and climate change community, we really want to see health in all climate policies. Because if we're going to tackle the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, we need to ensure that we're not doing it just to protect our finances or our infrastructure, but that we're doing it to protect our people, ourselves and our children. So perhaps the question to the panel is, we're seeing in COP28 a lot of focus being put on health, which is fantastic. It's putting health back at the core of the climate conversation and people back at the center of the discussion. But the question is, which opportunities are there to catalyze this cross-disciplinary work to integrate uh, health into the climate conversation? And do you see any opportunities that we should be leveraging now to ensure that we do deliver a healthy, livable future? Any of our panelists who wants to start? So I, I will kick off and I have to say it's one of my great privileges to be part of the Lancet Countdown, which you you run so incredibly well. Um, for me, I think it's really important that COP28 has a health day. It's been a long time coming. There's been lots of stuff like uh, politics behind, but we now have a health day, which means that at a climate conference, health is central and the reason being is because as you said so eloquently guess what all of the things that we are asking for to deal with climate change we should be doing anyway to improve people's health so moving to a plant-based diet if we do that globally we half the amount of water we use for agriculture we use half the land and we use because we produce half the carbon emissions and guess what? 10 million people each year won't die from poor nutrition and poor diet. And that's both on the obese side and, of course, on the extreme poverty side. And so these win-wins are incredible. I mean, for in the UK, the one thing that I get uh, I'm very, uh, I would say, irate about is the whole thing about, of course, we should move to um, heat exchangers because heat exchangers, they will warm your house but they also call your house, win-win. So when we're having these heat waves in the future, we will have a system that looks after our residential buildings, which can warm and cool like everywhere else. For me though, what we need to do is we need to make sure that the healthcare professionals around the world who have huge amounts to deal with anyway, but we try to actually make sure that they are educated and they are understanding the threats of climate change. I think that's really important. I think the second thing is how we actually then mobilize that. And what many people don't realize is one of the biggest costs that all countries have is health. OK, so any saving you can make in healthcare, whether it happens to be because people don't get sick from air pollution, they don't actually sort of like have problems because of their poor diet. That saving is huge. And so therefore, what we need to do is also convince the finance ministers that looking after people's health and because of climate change works. And it's that getting government to be connected and understand that you save a dollar here, you can spend a dollar there. Thank you so much, Mark. Does anyone else want to add to that? Yes, Nairali, go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think that um, the one of the, the really important things in 
in talking about climate change is the way that we link this back to people. And we see this in the, the most recent um, IPCC report, the synthesis report that came out that had that iconic um, image, um, Mark in his talk pointed to the, the climate stripes. Um, but in that IPCC re report, we saw a version of the climate stripes that actually linked that so that you can visualize that in terms of generations. And by bringing people into that story, we're not just talking about some sort of abstract change in our climate. We're talking about how does this actually relate to the people that we care about, to um, our our um, our children, our grandchildren. What's it going to mean for them? And that's where we we know when we look at that. Um, climate science data about how we expect these extreme events to change in the future, we see these very big changes in the intergenerational cost that we will expect from these extreme events on people. So, for example, uh, children who are born in 2020, in their lifetime, they will expect to experience two to seven times as many heat waves as people who were born in 1960. So being able to take that um, that climate data where we know that heat waves are becoming more intense, more frequent, um, they're happening, um, they're lasting for longer. Uh, but being able to actually relate that to what does that mean in terms of people and what does that mean in terms of uh, our future generations and what they'll have to live with and what health systems are going to need to be there to support them through that. Thank you, Natalie. Um, Lavanya? Thank you, Mitzi, uh, and thank you all for a really fascinating uh, sort of set of comments on health and uh, climate change. Um, my uh, sort of intervention sort of speaks, as you might expect, the legal dimensions of this. And I think one of the great advantages of having health at the center of this conversation is that it brings attention to rights. Um, so whether it's a right to a healthy environment or right to health, and these are enshrined in international treaties that many states are party to and they're part of national constitutions. So there is a possibility of actually uh, leveraging the rights framing of of these issues to actually uh, sort of uh, 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 catalyze change domestically in policy. Um, so many of the cases that are in national courts uh, in particular, but also in regional courts right now, are uh, are sort of centered on a rights approach uh, to climate change that, um, you know, the kinds of impacts that we've been talking about could actually be avoided if there were uh, if states were doing more both on mitigation as well as on adaptation and uh and I, that's one particular uh sort of uh, approach to leveraging change uh from a legal perspective the flip side however of this focus on uh rights and focus on you know having people at the center of the conversation is that it is a very anthropocentric view which means those that uh, are concerned about extinction of other species and all of these other uh, sorts of impacts of climate change that go beyond just impacts on human beings um, will find that their sort of concerns are being uh, sort of diluted to some extent. So while keeping that in, in, in mind, we still, of course, can leverage the legal solutions in relation to uh, the impacts of climate change on health. Thank you. Thank you, Lavanya. And it's really interesting how you guys really emphasize how health is about people, how climate is about people, and essentially really the fight against the climate crisis is the fight for life. And that each statistic and report that's being put out there, it is a memory and an experience for us in the global south who have seen it, who know it, who have felt it. And Lavanya, your last insights on um, having a less anthrop uh, anthropocentric view on it um, actually brings me to Gustavo Ludeman. Uh, I know, Gustavo, you've previously talked about the critical importance of planetary health. And I wonder if you might touch on that and how that can indirectly or directly affect climate and our human health from your perspective. Uh, thank you, Mitzi. Yeah, I, I would really thank Mark, Marina, and Sanjay for bringing up all this. Uh, uh, complex uh, uh, relations of, of climate change and health in, in such an easy way to understand. Uh, but I, I want to highlight uh, uh, another dimension that, that affects uh, human health, that is plant health, that is uh, related to plant disease. Uh, because climate change is happening in a, in a world that is rapid, rapidly 
uh, diminishing the, the, the genetic diversity of cultures and plants uh, in general. And this is directly related to a reduced plant resistance to new and uh, new a new biogeography of uh, 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 plant diseases. And uh, um, this reduced resistance uh, is directly also uh, related to, to a risk of famine uh, and also on poor uh, nutritional quality of food. Uh, so I think this is also related to uh, what uh, Sir David King uh, mentioned about our fourth uh, R, that is resilience. And uh, um, the, the, our resilience is, is uh, 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 diminishing because of this uh, uh, loss of genetic uh, uh, loss in agriculture. Uh, and also we have to do to put more uh, resources on research on the bio biogeography of plant diseases uh, uh, because of this of this uh, uh, enhanced risk of famine and uh, poor nutritional quality that, that that we are facing so uh, i think this this should go together with research on on on, on human health and climate change this is what i wanted to add Thank you so much, Gustavo. And I completely agree that plant health is something that will affect climate change and human health. And I think the society and the system we have now has made people think that we are not part of biodiversity, that we are separate from everything else, but we are dependent on the ecosystems around us just as much as they are dependent on us, um, even more so, I would say. I do also want to give us a little bit of time to breathe and acknowledge that as climate scientists and climate activists who are so deep in the the science and the information i'm sure a lot of times we also forgo our own climate health and mental health and, um especially with climate anxiety um sir david king do you want to add something i just wanted to come in quickly while they're fixing that uh, very important broadcast and say a, a little bit about the point that lavanya was raising uh which really relates to biodiversity in general. I, I thought it was wonderful to have uh, the, the presentation by Gustavo to stress the importance of uh, biodiversity in the plant systems of the world. But frankly, this is just one area where our ecosystems are not recognized as an important part of our own livelihood. We, we cannot exist without the ecosystems around us being close to normal going right back to the very opening speech where we have a small zone where we live in and create as a livable zone and so does every other creature and so as we move forward in time unless we learn how we human beings can recognize that we are a part of nature and not apart from nature that we really have to understand. We are a part of those ecosystems and we therefore need to nurture them. And this is an area where we, most of us in the world, ought to be learning from the indigenous people of the world because the indigenous people of the world really understood that they, their livelihood and their lifespan depended on managing their own ecosystems through living in them. Thank you, Sir David King. I was actually with an Indigenous community just last week, and a key message that they told me then was to nurture the ecosystems around us and to also allow it to nurture us and for us to connect back to that and not have the ecosystems around us nurture us in the way that we're doing it now, where it's very extractive, but really one that is more um, in tune. I instead will be reading, uh, reading out Iris's question now. Um, because they were not able to arrange the video, but her question was, what does the long-term health impact look like for people experiencing secondhand wildfire smoke? Um, and to link that to a bigger question to the panel, to what extent are we already seeing climate-caused health problems on a large scale, and how much bigger is this problem than what we actually see in media? Thank 
So that's a huge question. So I, I'm I'm going to kick off. I'm unfortunately not a medic. Uh, they uh, wouldn't trust me with uh, people's lives. Uh, but I would say that the important thing is that we are seeing lots of impacts on human health, which aren't necessarily picked up by the media. Because the problem is the media only sees the immediacy. So when we had those incredible floods in Pakistan, which affected 30 million people, they made the front page for a day or two and then disappeared. But those 30 million people, that effect on their livelihoods, their health, not just happened for those two days, but for weeks, months, years, and some of the health effects like wildfires last for decades and actually can reduce people's uh, life expectancy. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Nerali, go ahead. Yeah, um, so so again, um, without being a, an expert in, in this area, but just being able to to bring in an example um, from the, the Black Summer fires that we had in Australia a few years ago. Um, and again, linking in with, with Mark's point of the, there's sort of the immediate effects. So uh, in those wildfires, there were 33 people directly lost their lives um, during the fires. But then there were more than 400 people who lost their lives because of the, the health impacts of the fires. And there were more than 3,000 people were hospitalised because of the, the health impacts of, of the fires. And so, so there is a much broader um, impact than what is often recognised and reported as the, the immediate effects and the, the way that these things affect our health. And one of the things that we need to also be con considering when we're thinking about these events are the, the factors that, that compound or cascade the impacts. So, for example, often when we have something like a, a wildfire event, um, it's also associated with a heat wave. And so we, we have those, those heat waves that are already stressing um, people and ecosystems, and then we have the the fire comes in on top and the, the smoke. So even for people who aren't directly in the where the fire is happening, that smoke spreads around and can have a broader impact. Um, so so yes, I think just bringing in that example as to some of those broader impacts that we don't necessarily hear about. Thank you, and Marina. Thank you. I will echo everything that has been said um, just now and uh, stress perhaps what uh, Nerly just said about you know, what we call the multi-hit scenarios. That is these kind of multiple impacts happening one over the other and adding to a burden of disease that you cannot capture in isolation. And those interactions are really difficult to capture. Our models generally do not capture the interaction between all these many multiple factors. And that's why we always talk about a systems approach to climate change and health. But one of the things that we very rarely take into account is the, the slow onset events and how those are starting to erode the pillars of health. So in general, it's very visible when we have a wildfire or a heat wave or an extreme weather event, they're very, very visible newsworthy events. But perhaps the most worrying one are those slow onset events, the ones that are starting to erode our um, food security, our water security, and even our social determinants and economic determinants of health. Our livelihoods, our health depends on our livelihoods. So that's why it's so important that climate action is taken in a holistic manner and that the health implications of all the systems that health depends on are taken into account when we devise responses to climate change and that we think about the benefits that we could give to future generations by tackling um, not only the, the sources of climate change, but also building resilience within all of these health supporting systems. Thank you, Marina. I think that is a wonderful point to end this session on and that's a wrap for today it was an amazing session so thank you to everyone for joining and taking part in particular thank you to professor mark maslin and to our guests dr marina romaneo and professor sanjay and Cisadia and iris zan thank you also to all of those who tuned in at home and we'll see you at next month's meeting <laughs>